if they're gonna get started. I'm not sure if uh, Mike or anybody else is joining. I think Mihai has a complex cell, so he can join this one. Is it worth like moving it a bit? Um, so that he can join. Let me let me like, ask him what like a temporary thing. Yeah, I think it's. Yeah, let's ask him about that. I don't know. Oh, oh there he is, actually. <laughs> Never mind. Anyway. Does this time work for you, Mihai? I know you have like a conflict usually. Uh, right? Yeah, this time today it worked because the DeepMind Fox moved it for tomorrow. Yeah. Nice. Is, is, is it worth moving this meeting so that you can attend it more consistently or no? Or is it like a short-term thing? Uh, if it's, it should be a short-term thing, so it doesn't matter. Okay. get started um uh, ask a, a few people on the call that are new if anybody wants to do a quick introduction uh, uh that's the, the the um oh you have to do the the bottom yeah go ahead yeah yeah you do it <laughs> <laughs> i think mike does the best but i'm gonna try my best uh, <laughs> um this is open this is a um guac Maintain a meeting call um, as we've all been. This is a projects and meetings. This is governed by the code of conduct for the Linux Foundation OpenSSF, uh, as well as antitrust policies. Um, so we are all coming here to collaborate in order to, to work on uh, open source and not to kind of uh, collude together. Um, yeah, this meeting is recorded and will be available publicly. And that's about it. Yeah, it looks like we have a couple new folks in the call, although some of them may not be new because I wasn't here for the past two. Are we doing individual introductions? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, so I'm from Guidewire. Uh, I just started working on a team that is using Box. Um, so been playing around um, internally. We are to update Cork. I have been running into some issues and thought I'll just drop by this meeting. Awesome. Good to you. Oh, gosh, yes. Um, hi everyone. Um, I'm Abhishek. I'm a, I'm a PhD student at Purdue. I work with uh, Professor Santiago and Soham. I, I know he's been pretty active uh, for some time. Uh, I was active for some time, but uh, I've been interning with, with Bloomberg for a while now, so I haven't really been active, but I would love to get back into it and see how things are. Are you based in uh, New York? Yeah, I am. Okay, yeah, we should find a hangout plan, so. <laughs> Sure, I'll get in touch with you. Um, I'm Alistair. I'm a database nerd. I have been um, asked by my, my new employers at Kona to come and uh, give you some help with the database performance problems um, with your, your interactions with Postgres. So, yeah, we just, we just met Alistair this morning uh, to chat through some of that stuff. Glad you can glad you can join us. Uh, 
All right, um, Ben, did you want to start? Give me a couple open items. There were a couple, a couple things that I had uh, put on there. Um, <clears throat> first one is I was going through and adding some stuff to the Guac Docs README on Friday, and I discovered that there's some unclear licensing. Um, the, the file in the root of the repo um, says that it is under the MIT license, and there's a couple of um, GitHub workflow files that have a Apache license header. Um, and so before I, you know, added uh, explicit license information to the readme, I wanted to make sure that either, you know, if that's intentional, like that's fine, licenses can coexist in the repo. Um, but if it wasn't, we should correct that. Um, and that way it's uh, clear what people are contributing to and under what conditions. I'm trying to see what's this. What's the Apache license again? Oh, in the GitHub directory. Okay, within the head desk. All right, I see. I think it's not intentional. Also, I, I wonder why we decided on MIT for this repo. Or which 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 repo is this again? Sorry. The Guac Docs. Guac Docs, Guac Docs I, repo. I'm guessing oh. that's the license of the just the docs plugin. Probably. And... Yeah, I have a feeling. It's probably that. In which case we should switch it to something like the the code is MIT or whatever and the content is Creative Commons. Yeah. Because I think, yeah, so generally I know the Linux Foundation says, hey, uh, Creative Commons, and I think the one that they tend to prefer is Creative Commons by attribution. So like essentially just you need to, like if, if somebody takes the content from here, they just need to attribute it back to the original source. Um, yeah. Well, I guess, um, so I guess for the, I think, Ben's question is that we have workflows within uh, which have Apache license copyright headers. So I'm looking through this. There's not actually any code in here, right? For just the docs. Like in, in this repo, there isn't any just the docs code. So technically we should we can change it to Apache. I mean if we copy the original yeah, I... config YAML index MD gem file, all that stuff is like copyrighted and licensed. I copyrighted just the docs and licensed MIT. I mean, it, there's some question as to whether or not those are copyrightable, you know, elements in the first place. But yeah. I think it's better to preserve the license and attribution, even if it's not actually copyrightable, than to not do mm -hmm. it and find out that it is. Right. Um, yeah, like, I like Mike's idea of like, you know, the code is under whatever license, and then the content is under a more content appropriate license. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so, so, oh, go ahead. So the only thing is we, we need to make sure that um, the license, whatever license we go from and to, like can be done in a way that we don't have to go through and ask all 19 contributors for permission. Or if we do, we have to, you know, would need to go ask all 19 contributors like, hey, are you okay with Taking, you know, relicensing. I going from MIT, that shouldn't be a problem. Um, yeah. To, um, and I think in our contribution, or I think I also in our contributing.md, we were more or less saying like, you're accepting future um, license changes to the content to anything that they contribute. 
but I think, yeah, with MIT, it shouldn't be an issue. Um, so, so just again, just to kind of like highlight this. So there's three main licenses that LF pushes for. So it's creative commons for the content. Um, uh, uh, obviously Apache and, and to a lesser extent, MIT or, or BSD for, for licensing, um, and GPL with exceptions. Um, and then the third thing is if it's a specification, it's something called the community specific, uh, community specification license. So just wanted to th throw that out there. So if, if, for example, in the future, we created something like the Guac API standard so that anybody who wanted to ask questions about supply chain, like this is what this, this is what the specification would be for that API that would fall under what is called the community specification license. So I don't see anything saying that uh, by contributing, you give up the right to, you allow a future relicense. All I see is DCO and that's in the main, Oh, uh, the main re main repo, not in the docs repo. Hmm. I, I don't think it would be an issue for the licenses we're currently using, but it would, it's a, some, a, a risk to be aware of. Um, it sounds like there's a general consensus though. So if we want, I'll just open an issue um, saying let's, you know, switch to these. And then if you, you know, if the maintainers say yes, then, you know, just for, to have the, that record keeping and then I can go through and figure out whatever needs to get done to make it happen. But I think by and large, it should be pretty trivial. Yeah, and, and, and the LF uh, staff, is set up to help out with that sort of thing because they've done it in the past and I'm pretty sure MIT and Apache code licenses are largely compatible with the Creative Commons stuff. I think the only thing was just like, they want the Creative Commons stuff just because of like a handful of like weird, like nitpicky kind of things um, that just make it easier to deal with when it's over on Creative Commons rather than like a code specific. Like So what about the workflow files then? Those were probably just copied over from Guac, which was Apache 2.0. I mean, I think that we could either leave and just, you know, be say, yes, this is an intentional decision, or we can, you know, um, license, should be able to license those under MIT as well. I have to double check the specifics of the Apache license. I don't think it's an issue to have them be separate. Um, mm -hmm. As long as I, my main concern was like, hey, are we doing this on purpose or not? And if we're not, then we should fix it. And if we are, then you know, we just have a record of it. All right. Well, then I will open that issue. It sounds like what we want to do is leave the workflow files under the Apache license because why bother? Um, and then say code is under MIT and content is CC by. All right, so I'll, I'll open that for paperwork purposes and then um, make sure we can just do that and then do the thing. All right, so I guess the, the the next thing was also me. Um, just had a couple of things to gently nudge on. Um, one is the uh, my request to be promoted to owner for web and marketing. Um, I went through and added the specific links to work that Brandon had requested. Um, so this is just sort of sitting. Um, and also the contributing page. Um, uh, there's details in the uh, in the issue, but there's a couple parts where I've kind of invented um, process for how people should request um, promotions because that wasn't really explicitly defined. And also, um, you know, it starts kind of starts a process of moving some of the stuff out of the guac uh, contributing file into a central location, which happens to be the web. Um, I think, you know, that 
is because that way we don't have to replicate that contributing file across every repo. Um, and I think most people aren't going to be looking at the contributing file in the repo. They probably look on the website with other sort of central information anyway. Um, but I wanted to make sure that that was explicitly called out for maintainers in case there are objections. Uh, I don't know that we need to discuss it here on the call unless anyone has some really burning concerns with either of them. Uh, but I wanted it on here just as a, hey, please go look at this and um, either thumbs up or thumbs down. Yeah, con contributor pages always seem to have a weird mix of like code of conduct, legal stuff, contributor ladder with things like uh, what we expect you to do if you open a PR or like how to run the make file. <laughs> yeah, and I, I'd, I'd like to eventually get to the point where we have sort of the process of like the meta stuff and community governance stuff separate from the technical contributor mm -hmm. parts. Um, yeah. But... So you intend for this to be project governance level type things. Yeah. So we'll still have like a contributing MD in each repo, which might have something like, here's how you run the tests and then a link to this page for everything else. Yeah, I think that that's the a good end goal. Okay, sounds great. Um, so I have a quick question. Um, so the governance repo and the contributing repo and the regular repo, I guess like what's what will end up being the, like what's the governance repo for, but the governance repo pointed the contributing page or like, I, I guess that's, that's uh, where, where's the split? If that that's what I'm yeah so I see the governance repo is primarily being I, you know it's where we're storing the you know um, notes from the uh, meetings and then like issues around like people that's where people open issues for sort of project level gov like governance kind of thing so you know code of conduct issues um, promotion things like that um, and then um, you know, the, the docs repo is where we have sort of the, the content that people would look at. Um, and then, you know, in each sort of technical repo, there are maybe things that are specific to um, that particular repo. So like, you know, certain standards that we might have for PRs to guac versus, uh, you know, guac docs, things like that. Um, one question that came up is like, could we, you know, have the governance like the web the web content for specifically governance related come out of the governance repo for uh, access control purposes and like the short answer is yes we could but i tend to think at the scale of this project that um, adds a lot of technical complexity where we could just um, handle by policy and um, smacking people's hands if they do the wrong thing and you know revert bad commits kind of thing um, you know, if we get to the scale of Kubernetes, uh, you know, then we'll <laughs> need some more robust stuff in place. So the idea is to, because I think right now we also have like, we still have the governance of MD, we still have all the, the, the MDs that would point to the governance of and all the, the contributing page, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. What's the what's the next step for the promotion? I think it's just I think everybody on the call, all the maintainers, I think give a thumbs up at this point. So it's just changing permissions. Yep, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have N minus one, so we're good. One thing we we one thing we may want to consider is like do we need to create like groups in the in the org for the different areas? 
Um, and then also, I, you know, I, I don't. I have uh, I have some thoughts about how n n minus one might not be appropriate um, for certain things like this, where um, you know if we have to if there are two maintainers who just aren't around for a few weeks, we're you know blocking things unnecessarily. And um, that's not a a conversation we need to have right now, but um, I may have a proposal about that in the future, um, just to you know prevent these sort of like un unobjectionable decisions from happening for longer periods of time. Well, we, we don't have the N minus one for every decision. It's only for governance changes. Right. But I, yeah, I think there might be a, a need for another tier where, I don't know. I, I'll have to think about it some more before I decide what I what my opinion is. But um... Yeah, for the groups, I think I like that idea. And I was suggesting in chat, uh, maybe to move to Plumi the same way as Sixtor does. Because then we can organize the same groups across the entire org. The GitHub ones are per repo. I don't have any particular opinion on that. If it makes management easier, then I'm all for it. So that was all I had on those. So if we want to move on, we can. Or if there, there's still more to discuss, then happy to continue the conversation. I think we should be good. I, I think it looks like you've gotten two approvals on the the PR now, so it should be good. All right, so. Next thing is if anybody, you know, anybody outside of the maintainers on the call had any questions that they want to discuss quickly before we move on to any other topics. Yeah, I have a question. So trying to find a dog where any all the companies. So I've been trying to understand uh, all the binaries that it builds, the, the Gawk repo builds. Uh, and, try, um, and I was trying to understand, is there a doc which outlines like how do these processes talk to each other and what is the functions of all these processes? So I found one design doc. I don't know if that is the current one. It's a Google doc. And a follow-up question to that would be, uh, wait, okay, can you link the doc that, that you're, you're looking at? Sorry? Can you link the doc that you're looking at so that we make sure that's the right uh, one? Yeah. I just posted a couple links in the chat. So um, the second one, the docs.guac.sh kind of covers conceptually what the different parts of Quark are. Um, it does include things like assembler, which isn't exactly one-to-one -one with the CLI command. Um, so those conceptually are like what the components are called, like what you'll see in code um, when you look at the different directories. Uh, and then I also linked a readme that kind of covers a little bit more um, technical, low-level, like what we're putting in each command. Like for example, both, like walk one will run a, an assembler inside of it because um, it's like an all-in-one command. Whereas the ingest, guac ingest runs an assembler, but it you have to run a collector separately. Um, so that's a little bit described in that readme that's in the command directory. Um, I assume that that one can easily be enhanced. It, 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 uh, as far as like, well, if you if you find things that are out of date or, you know, can be described more in more detail. But I think those are the two things that kind of cover this area. Um, 
Yeah, this design doc might be a little bit out of date as far as uh, the CLIs themselves, but maybe yeah. more just design overall. Yeah, I, I just said that I hit that too. Ask folks to look at the bucket message if possible. Um, this, so yeah, this is more like a PRD, it's like a requirement and, and kind of like initial thoughts. We can add uh, everybody knows. Yeah, I, I recommend probably like it's, it gives a little bit of context, but it is in the most up to date. So uh, the, the dots that Jeff linked, I think still are uh, canonical. Okay. Um, and also, is there any guide out there how to deploy Gawk on Kubernetes? I know there is a Helm chart, but let's say if you want to just pick and choose few components and run uh, the a few components just as a separate services, um, something like that. Has anyone done that? Um. Sunny, the contributor to the Helm chart, isn't here right now, um, so he could go into more detail. I think he might be able to answer on Slack. But um, in general, a lot of the Helm chart stuff is uh, has parameters uh, or options for all the different pieces. So, yeah, like once you realize kind of like what are the actual components you want to run, like maybe you want to run an extra collector that is like the GitHub collector or something like that. I believe then you could go and, and edit the, the chart or use those parameters to, to run the pieces that you want there. Okay. Yeah, the actual repo does contain a readme and it ha it does list all the different you know, uh, values you can set. So if you want to enable or disable all that kind of stuff is all there. So that might be something to look at. And if you have, yeah, if, like if you have further questions, if you uh, Sunny is on the on the uh, on the open you know open SSF guac, ping him. I think he may be able to answer specific questions if you have it. Okay, all right. Yeah, this is very helpful. Thank you very much. Awesome. Um, I do have to drop for another call. Um, I think you guys can continue on. We did have the you know 1.0 discussions. We can keep going going, going forward with. Right, thank you. Cool. Yeah, I think we can very chat briefly about it, but I think probably we we want half a mic <laughs> if we want to make any decisions. But we can continue chatting about it. Um, so the last time we had the 1.0 discussion, let me, let me bring up the, let me bring up the list. Okay. Yeah. One second. Cool. Um, so I think the last time we we talked about this, we listed the. Um, let me share my screen actually. We listed the different kind of components of advisor: the collectors, the ingesters, assemblers. Green means kind of like stable and. Yellow is kind of like, uh, yeah, we, we probably will make some iterations to these. Um, and so the question is, do we, like, how do we handle kind of interactions so that uh, the users don't break? What are kind of the, the contractual uh, API stability promises that we want to have? Uh, and I think one of the things we talked about um, I think this is where we, uh, like, between Jeff and I, we had a bit of confusion because I thought he was talking about 
minor versions when we were talking about major versions. <laughs> we can revisit this a little bit. Uh, basically, like, when, do, when can we do CRI change, changes, graph TL changes, or naming changes, uh, nothing that's major redesign. Um, we kind of measured this by uh, changes required by users um, being being bound to a certain 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 amount, um, kind of like the frequency of how, how <coughs> we provide a, a major or minor patch, um, and then we talked a little bit about kind of like open open questions around what are some of the gaps that we think need to be resolved for one point oh. Um, so I think we can go through this this list that we 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 continue on um. So we talked about persistent being able to large handle large inputs and well tested. Um, I think we have the persistency. Uh, we have the ability to ingest large inputs. I think the query is like kind of like a question mark. I think that's that's where, um, you know, I think Alistair's involvement can help as well. Um, provide some some light on that. Um, we have. Pops up with the document blobs using Go Cloud library to abstract it away from blob store. Um, this is to help the ingestion. Um, the last time we talked about doing a user user study, um, I think one of the requirements we we're saying is that there should be 1.0 should be a place where a user can come and say, "Look, I'm having this particular problem. Here's a way I can solve it." Um, one of the things that we kind of discussed briefly um, last time was saying like let's do an end user study uh, to have a like acceptance criteria on like what would a user A use this for? You know, we we in the end the 1.0 should provide some welded paths for end users to achieve what they want to do. Um, we did talk about who the end users that we would interview are. Um, you know, I think one of the, the topics that brought up is we may want kind of like a fresh perspective on this. And so like finding new users of Guac who are, um, doing, using it for the first time, I want to do something with the organization. You know, I think we, we mentioned like, you know, Nisha in the chat that's kind of starting to look at it. It would be a good choice. Um, I think we're looking for feedback on like, who are some of the people that may be using Guac to try and solve some of the organizational problems. I think that would be a, um, you know, a, we are working to collect some of these names. Um, I don't know whether Ben, um, do you have any thoughts on thoughts on that kind of like users that are kind of starting to look at Guac and want to do something with it? Nobody offhand, but I can think about that and try and uh, find a few more. Awesome. Um, yeah. Um, so we wanted to create REST API stability uh, roles around, you know, whether something's alpha, whether something's beta, v1, v2. Um, how does that kind of map onto the maturity cycle? Um, you know, is it a user your own risk versus um, this will only have minor changes, this will change every six months and so on. Um, I'll be sure we don't have a, a example of that yet. Um, I had it on my list to kind of write down a kind of a series of questions to ask users, uh, but it's pretty much going to be like a um, like an interview and kind of basing off that. Uh, if you're interested in in kind of maybe getting involved with this, 
uh, I'd be happy to work with you on that. Um, one of the things that we've been working on is to resolve is dependency GraphQL issues from package name to package version mapping to only point to the package version for its dependency. I think we have pretty much reached this goal. Um, yeah, that's done, right? It was part of the 080 release yeah. too. So I'm going to mark the green once it's done. Um, figure out and implement and collect sub-stability story. I think this is the thing that is pretty much not done, done yet. Um, authentication and authorization. I think we agreed that this is probably not in scope for 1.0, right? Um, So we talked about this last time that needs to be done. I think this one we haven't talked about raising the bar API changes as we approach 1.0. How, how do we want to? Well, think... what are we, what are we going to do after 1.0 is maybe a question. Like if something requires an API change, what do we say? <laughs> that, yeah, my, my, my thought is to um so I it is maybe controversial, but um in the container image layer uh, discussion, like I think I propose a generic predicate type. And my thought is to say that like let's have this generic predicate type. It doesn't mean much unless you give meaning to it. Um like if anything that you want to express cannot be expressed by the current API, put it in here. And then if it's used enough, we'll promote it to the, the API. But I realize that's also like, Possibly uh, a foot gun that we provide people. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know what to say about that. Um, as far as raising the bar, I mean, like, what do we? I mean, basically, I I feel like after one point oh, if we had a feature that would require a change, we would just delay it. We would just say, um, you know, let's put that in the two point oh bucket. And raising the bar could just be a trial of that. <laughs> I mean. I guess what well, doesn't mean to raise the bar, right? It's just like, we're not going to do it now. It's saying no to API changes as we're going to 1.0. Um, and seeing the reaction, or is there a way yeah. that we want to? Like right now, I think raising the bar is is very qualitative, right? It's like, do we think that this is an important feature? Um, and so, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, we keep yeah, we keep saying that we won't. You know, one point will be a solid. You know, a, a solid API that we're not going to change, but we don't know what it's going to be like when we get there. So is that what, the, is that what this line is? You know, like do a trial, do a consideration. Like we just made this is dependency change. And I think we knew that we, that's what something we wanted to do for a while, but we also just like, we've been doing, we've been trying to like get in all the API changes now and try to, so therefore we've been freely changing the API, 
but maybe we need to go through a trial or a, a, a soft lock or something like that on it and then collect the things that have come up and maybe do a decision if we think the API is stable or not at a later point. What doing something, but all like saying like, okay, here, we're going to do a release candidate of the mm -hmm. API. Mm -hmm. And like once that release candidate has, is no longer different from the current API for, for, for three months, then we are, we're set. Yeah. Yeah. The thing that I think is a question is the user interviews or case studies because theoretically like those should go on top of the api right like we we think we have a good api and then we like oh we need to do some use cases we need to do some uh, queries cli commands rest commands um but is that kind of a chicken and egg like are we <laughs> are we gonna go do that and then be like oh we need to change the api <laughs> I guess it's a let's find out, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and if, if our API is good enough, then it should answer most of the questions. And we should try really hard to solve it with current API, and unless it really doesn't fit. Um, then we should change it. Some of those might be, can be answered with um, changes that aren't backwards incompatible. Um, right, so does this, does the freeze on the API refer to, um, only refer to incompatible changes or, or all modifications say, adding a new endpoint to the REST API. I think for the graph, I, I think you, you bring up a good point where that we actually have like two APIs we're talking about here. Um, I think for the GraphQL endpoint, we can't actually, it isn't safe to add still because for some reason the GraphQL client and the server require that the specifications be equivalent. Uh, I think as we've seen, whenever we upgrade the API, even though you're using the same function, um, the GraphQL as server gives an error. Uh, I may be wrong on this, so someone better date me on that. Yeah, schema embedded. Um, so unfortunately for GraphQL, it has to be like, uh, there's no backwards compatibility story just on the, like, we still have to rebuild the clients in the server and redistribute them and get them deployed. Um, for the REST API, I agree that, yeah, I, I think that could be like, uh, I, think, I think that's like maybe like saying something about what's a, a, a alpha beta um, version of the REST API and kind of what we do around that. Yeah. Which I think if you, if you have some ideas, um, we'd be, since you you designed the the implemented the REST API, I think we'd be happy to to hear hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think at, at this point it would be more um, like looking for use cases um, and answering some of those questions. Um, I think I'd say it's more exper it's I think it's more experimental at the moment. Okay. So based on this list, it looks like um I don't remember what I'm sharing my screen. Oh I am there. Um the green ones are done. The yellow ones I think are in progress. Um I don't think, yeah, and I think that eventually we want to hit all these are green and then that should give us 1.0. What is left on the second bullet, the pump sub stuff? Um, I 
Uh, isn't that timed? I'm not sure. I I think this this one this one this was the one that I I had a good handle on. Is this something you copied from a long time ago? Yeah, I think it's from one of Path's better points. Okay, yeah, yeah, this is all done. Like the This is all done. we use GoCloud for PubSub and then we use a blob store. We use GoCloud for blob store for all the ingestion. Okay. Okay, let me put this under here so then we can make progress on kind of big strokes of things. Um, so I think for this, we have to come up with a uh, for persistence and large data set, what is a um, acceptance criteria for this? Like how big? Um, could, and this could be informed by by user studies as well, um, both new and existing. Um, test that criteria. Okay, this one we have next steps. Um, I think finding a list of users and then I work with Average Shack to 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 kind of design the interview. Um this one's done. I don't think we I can't remember whether Path was actively looking into this, the, the collect subscriber. I don't so, think he is right now. Okay. Um and I wanna say that the API stuff currently is blocked on the user study. Um, although I think some of these probably could be defined separately. Um, I think we have enough to make forward progress on the 1.0. Um, is there anyone that would like to kind of explore the, the API definition of what is acceptance for that? Oh, we, I, we could also talk about this in the, in the broader group discussion. I can look into the, the part for the REST API. Okay, awesome. Awesome, thank you, Marco. Yeah, more colors on this look good. Um, cool, and then I think we should be in a pretty good spot. Um, any other, any other thoughts? Yeah, I think we want to double check this schema stuff with the GraphQL. Um, cause I think that impacts some of that stuff that we we're talking above, like from one, two to one, three. Would we be okay with the schema change if it was backwards compatible, but or not if it requires the client to like pull in the new schema? Um, I can do that. 
function. So like what version changes and see my changes result in result in X, Y, Z, like different actions by users. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. And then Jeff. Oh, wait. Uh, there we go. To me, Jeff. Awesome. Uh, Abhishek, can you can you send me your your email or something? So, so I sure, I, I, I can ping you in Slack if that's easier. Yeah. Um. Either, either open SSF or the CNCF one is good for me. Sounds sure. good. Uh, I'm gonna put Mihai's note here on the schema thing being. Cool. Um, anything, uh, anyone else wants to talk about in the last five minutes? Oh, if not, we'll see everyone. See you on next week. All right. Sounds Thank good. You. See ya. Bye. Thank you.